How is it that none of us can remember our first breath? Just consider its importance. For us, our first breath is our first instinctual act. Upon birth, we cry and wail out loud for it, unknowingly and selfishly demanding the breath to fill us with life from that moment forth. And yet time erases our memory, perhaps within an instant of first performing the act. And from then on out, just as we humans are prone to do, we take it for granted for the rest of our lives. Humanity gingerly clings to the surface of our planet. Let us call that surface the plane of existence. So as to avoid the esoteric, and for our specific purposes, the plane of existence for our fragile species exists from sea level to roughly 18,000 foot in surface elevation. However, humanity is adapted to a lowland environment where oxygen is plentiful. Spend too much time above 18,000 feet and supplemental oxygen is needed to survive. Without it, you could suffer from a condition known as altitude sickness, where low levels of oxygen leads to a swelling of the brain, fluid accumulation in the lungs, and sometimes death. As we climb much higher than 18,000 feet, things become a bit more dicey. If we leave the surface altogether and say, climb into a high altitude balloon, the frailty of our species becomes all the more apparent. As we float above 18,000 feet, we leave our plane of existence to discover an altogether inhospitable world. People cannot survive above this elevation indefinitely. And as a result, there are no settlements that exist today above this height. As we rise in elevation, air becomes less compressed and is therefore thinner. There are less air molecules for a given space. So despite the percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere remaining the same, the thinner air means there is less oxygen available to breathe. Here, the effective oxygen levels begin to fall dangerously low. If we float to 36,000 feet, about the cruising altitude for a modern airliner, we require supplemental oxygen to breathe. We must also bring our parkas, for the temperature at this elevation averages at a frigid negative 68 degrees Fahrenheit. This zone is known as the stratosphere. Almost nothing survives here, except for the occasional hardy organism floating on the edge of life. As we climb higher, to about 55,000 feet, the water vapor in our body starts to boil, causing our skin to inflate. But we anticipated this, for we are scientists, and we have brought our high altitude pressure suits. We don them immediately. At around 26 miles in elevation, we have reached the upper limits of manned balloons. There have only been a few brave souls to venture this high. The current record holder for highest manned flight in a balloon is Alan Eustace. Alan was an executive for Google and known as a risk taker with a passion for details. Alan got bored and wanted to do something ridiculous with his life. So in October of 2014, Alan floated off from Roswell, New Mexico, of all places, to a height of 25.73 miles. But instead of coasting back down, Alan decided to jump, or more accurately, release himself from his 35,000 cubic foot helium balloon and skydive back to Earth. It was a wild, wild ride, Alan said. I hugged onto the equipment module and tucked my legs and I held my head in. His legs were probably not the only thing he was tucking as he plummeted at 800 miles per hour for about four and a half minutes wearing what was basically a modern spacesuit. Despite the absurdity of the act, it was an incredible engineering feat. And Alan landed under parachute, safely back in our plane of existence. However, such technologies did not spontaneously pop into existence. The atmospheric pressure suit that Alan wore resulted as a culmination of hundreds of years of tried and true tinkering. And like Alan Eustace, it took men willing to tuck themselves in to uncomfortable situations to achieve them. 
Our plane of existence extends somewhat above the surface of the earth. However, there is another plane, inhospitable to man, which extends well below the surface, and 70% of the earth is covered in it. The murky depths of our oceans and lakes were once deemed unreachable, but there was good reason to reach them. Over the centuries, countless sailors gave their lives on the high seas, delivering goods and treasures across the globe. Many of the ships they crewed sank, and as a result, many a good man died diving down to retrieve those lost treasures. However, before the 1700s, there existed only very rudimentary diving suits or diving bells available to would-be treasure hunters. As a result, only wrecks and shallow waters were reachable, and even those conditions offered limited success. However, in 1715, an English wool merchant by the name of John Lethbridge climbed into a hogshead, Old English for barrel, and ordered himself sealed inside. Then John and his barrel were placed in a ditch and covered with water. There John stayed half an hour without communication of air. This experiment being tried, I then began to think of making my engine. And bingo, John Lethbridge invents the diving engine. Rudimentary in its design, yet quite practical, John Lethbridge diving engine was the first atmospheric diving suit. The diving engine was an oak wood barrel into which John fitted a viewing port made of glass and two holes for his arms to protrude through in order to do his good work. And his good work was retrieving sunken treasures. The diving engine was a pirate's dream suit. After climbing feet first into the barrel, the lid would be screwed down with large bolts, sealing the occupant off inside. Then our diver would stick both his arms through the holes provided. Leather cuffs that lined the holes would cling tightly to the arms, like a Chinese finger trap, creating a seal to prevent water from leaking in. Then, so as to have as much reserve air as possible, bellows would be used to pump fresh air into the barrel through a small hole, and then stopped up with plugs. He was then lowered by rope into the water. John claims he could stay submerged in the engine for up to 34 minutes without refreshing the air inside. There he linked cables and nets to sunken treasures that could then be hoisted up from above. His only communication with the surface was by a line he called a signal cable. A series of tugs on the cable conveyed messages to those above who were trusted with his life. John used the diving engine successfully on a number of wrecks, retrieving sunken goods for English and Dutch merchants, amongst others. He became a man of some notoriety and died wealthy in 1759. John Lethbridge was a maverick of history. Although he could not have dreamt of it at the time, his invention helped pave the way for other tinkerers to create new and more sophisticated atmospheric suits. The atmospheric suit is a marvel of human ingenuity. Designed properly, the atmospheric suit simulates an artificial version of Earth's atmosphere for the wearer. In essence, such suits allow one to carry our plane of existence with us wherever we may go. And since it is human instinct to push our boundaries, we have put these suits through the ringer. The ultimate test of the atmospheric suit was conducted on March 18, 1965, in Earth orbit. Alexei Leonov had a passion for art. As a child, he enjoyed drawing flowers and painting landscapes. He grew up in Stalin's Soviet Union, near Lake Baikal in Siberia. And during World War II, he spent hours at the local hospital sketching soldiers, officers, and battle scenes. Only nine years of age, he knew of war and its hardships. However, what young Alexei did not know was that some 40 years later, he would be painting pictures of his journeys into space. By the age of 26, Alexei was a cosmonaut. He was selected along with 19 other brave men to join the Soviet Union's first cosmonaut class. Included in the ranks was Yuri Gagarin, first man in space. But by the time Alexei was chosen to fly his first mission, 
About a dozen fellow cosmonauts had already gone to space. Some had not come back. Alexei's mission, however, was different from the rest. Unlike his brave comrades, Alexei was destined to leave the comforts of his small Voskhod 3KD spacecraft and be the first to float out into space in an experimental atmospheric pressure suit dubbed the Golden Eagle, the first true spacesuit. So after riding a Voskhod 11A rocket off of our earthly plane and coasting upon a superheated column of gas 104 miles high, Alexei and his crewmate, Pavel Belyov, settled into Earth orbit at a velocity somewhere above 17,600 miles per hour. But there was no time to muse on the journey. Work was the pulse of Soviet Russia. So they got right to it. At 0828, Greenwich Mean Time, only an hour and a half into the flight, Alexei Leonov depressurizes the Voskhod airlock. Then at 0832, Leonov opens the Voskhod 2 airlock hatch. One can only imagine the feelings he must have experienced as the hatch opened, revealing the exhaustive expanse of the great void. Nobody had ever stepped out into it before, let alone seen it from outside their ship. And nobody knew what to expect from the spacesuit. But Alexei was on a mission. It was his duty as test dummy to the motherland to get out there and see if it could be done. So at 0834, Leonov leaves the airlock. He departed his tiny craft carrying a white metal backpack containing roughly 45 minutes worth of oxygen and wearing the Golden Eagle. After attaching a camera to the end of his departure tunnel, Alexei let go of the ship and gently floated off. Alexei later wrote that he felt like a seagull with its wings outstretched, soaring high above the earth, proving that if we get going fast enough, man can fly. However, euphoria soon turned to deep concern. For only a few minutes into the flight, Alexei's suit began to puff up. At first, it was only a nuisance. Alexei found that due to his swollen gloves, he could not work the camera strapped to his chest. But as time passed, the suit started to swell to the point that he could not maneuver without great difficulty. Eventually, his crewmate urged him to come back inside. Alexei tugged on his tether, coasted back to the ship, and grabbed onto the tunnel. But he went in head first, not as was intended. And once back in the tunnel, he got wedged inside and could not make his way down it. The Golden Eagle had inflated. He was stuck, and his crewmate was unable to assist him. Alexei spent the next 10 minutes or so struggling to get inside his spacecraft. But no matter how hard he tried, he could not squeeze himself through. So he did the only thing he could do. I had to take a decision to lower the pressure inside the spacesuit. But by how much? Too much would have led to a boiling of blood in the body, which would have finished me off. But I had to do it. I didn't report this down to Earth. I knew the situation better than anyone else. Then after releasing some air from his suit, risking death, Alexei was able to scramble inside to sanctuary. At 0848, the hatch on the airlock is closed and secured by Leonov. The suit had worked, but not exactly as intended. Due to the slight malfunction, Alexei had spent 10 more minutes in space than intended, but in some way, this added to the success. Humans proved it was possible to soar like a seagull in space. Leonov later went on to command the Soviet half of the Apollo-Soyuz mission, the first joint space mission between the Soviet Union and the United States. He died on October 11, 2019, a famous artist and Russian hero. We live on the surface of a rock, in a bubble, floating in the pressureless vacuum of space. It took thousands of years for us to figure this out, but how many more years will it take for us to learn to live without it? How many more lives must we risk? Over the timeline of our history, countless thousands have died exploring the Earth, its atmosphere, and its watery depths. But this did not stop us from exploring. With great risk comes great reward. And now that we have stepped into this new frontier, there is no going back.